If I, if I may, I'm just going to enjoy a little sip of my vault Tech coffee right now. Mm. Please do. It's very good. There's a certain radiation quality to it, which makes it extra special. Although the ghoul presents as this unaffected character in Fallout, we see in fleeting moments that there's still maybe some tenderness there, like in the scene where he helps the adorable pup CX404. How does the ghoul relate to Cooper Howard now, and how much humanity do you think is still inside of him? You know, I'm still figuring that out, really. Uh, it's still a, a, a process that is in uh, evolving, as it were. At, seemingly at first, you know, none at all. Right, but uh, as the story progresses, and when you when you when you meet Cooper Howard, and you spend time in his world, all of that will uh, make even more sense. There is a, you know, I hope uh, for the ghoul uh, a level of humanity uh, that he can still access. You know, um, he, he's also there's something motivating him which is uh, kind of revealed over time, but there's a reason why he stayed alive this long, you know, despite living in an uninhabitable world. And uh, whether it's anger, whether it's revenge, whether it's uh, any number of things, um, I know what it is for me. Uh, and, and, uh, and we'll see how he, he grows as a person, especially if we get to do a season two. Amazing. So Lucy's relationship with the ghoul begins in a very antagonistic way, but then she does him a great kindness. How would you describe the evolution of their relationship throughout the season and what's their impact on one another? That's a great, what a great question. Very thoughtful question. Inherent in the game uh, are choices uh, for characters. It's built into the DNA of the video game uh, itself and Fallout. It's a big part of the game uh, as a player, right? And it was with intention that Jonah and Graham and Geneva introduced and keep introduces these dilemmas for all three of us uh, and gives us the option of, of doing, you know, a, a moral thing or an immoral thing. And as the show progresses, like in, in any, in life, I suppose, you know, uh, against, uh, in any kind of like, setting, people people change and people evolve and the protagonist can become the antagonist and then once again become the protagonist. And and so uh, you picked up on something that that will be explored for, for all three of us, um, especially for the ghoul and whether that act of kindness uh, is returned, uh, that, that I can't say. In the game, which you mentioned, the question of whether all ghouls are destined to become kind of feral is not really answered. And obviously that's a big question in the show's narrative too. How heavily do you think the threat of becoming feral weighs on the ghoul? Oh, I, I think it's an, an existential crisis every single day. You know, uh, people that are affected will become feral. Like that's a part of the rules of this universe. And so for the ghoul to, um, to have lived this long, uh, he has to get access to this medicine. And that requires money in the form of caps. And he has found that the best way to make money is obviously being a bounty hunter. But people will rob and they will kill and they will they will kill and, and still steal and lie to, to, to get access to this medicine to stay on this earth uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a form of conscious that is uh, normal for as long as they possibly can. And then the day comes where you don't have those access to that medicine and, and it's over. If you were in the world of Fallout, would you be a vault dweller, a lone wanderer, or part of the Brotherhood of Steel? A lone wanderer. Uh, if there's anything that all the characters that I've played over the course of my life, the one thing I think they have not in common is they are Scorpios, and maybe the other thing is that they are, you know, lone wolves. I'm very much a lone wolf in my own life. You know, I have a lot of friends, uh, but 
I'm most comfortable when I'm, uh, you know, alone with my kid or my wife or just, just me and, uh, and out on an open road. So even just from their first brief meeting, Lucy and Maximus seem to have an instant connection. How do you think crossing paths impacts each of your characters and their journeys? Um, you know, I think the first time Lucy and Maximus meet, I think it actually gives Lucy a little bit of hope. I think that um, mm. going up to the wasteland, it's quite a uh, demoralizing. Is that a word? Have I made that up? No, is that real? Is that, that a word? That exists. Yeah, demoralizing. That, that reels. <laughs> that, that feels real. Uh, uh, experience and um, meeting Maximus maybe spurs her on a little bit. Like, okay, no, there's, there might be hope in this wasteland after all. Little does she know. Little does she know. <laughs> <laughs> No, I and think they. How I mean, about for you, Aaron? Yeah, no, they have. They've so many. I mean, they come from totally different worlds, right? I mean, to be born and raised in a vault, or to be born and raised, you know, in the wasteland. I mean, it's it's really different perspectives, and um, I think they share some things as, at the same time as they really differ on a lot of things. And I think they they get the opportunity to uh, to learn from each other in different ways. It's funny because on Yellow Jackets, your character Jackie became dinner in the wilderness. And now we see that Lucy might be dining on human butt jerky in the <laughs> wastelands. Do you feel these two characters are in conversation at all? And will we see Lucy go fully primal? Ooh, maybe. Keep watching and you'll find out. <laughs> um, no, I think that I think they do. Uh, they have, you know, some things in common, for example, they start their journeys knowing exactly how their life is going to pan out. You know, they're very much their own person and they think they've got it all figured out. They get put into this impossible situation, the worst possible situation you'd, you'd hope to never be in. And um, they both are forced to adapt. Uh, where their journeys differ is, I think Jackie, she she tries she tries to adapt and, and I think she, she bends so far that she breaks and, and Lucy, uh, she's not gonna break. She'll change, she'll evolve, um, and, and she has to do that to survive. But uh, I think she'll last a little bit longer than Jackie did. Um, so if the two of you were transported into the world of Fallout, would you be vault dwellers, lone wanderers, or part of the Brotherhood of Steel? I think I would oh. go for the vault. I'd go for the vault. I want the showers, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, want, I wanna hang out, I wanna eat popcorn and, and canned goods, I, I wanna... I want to relax. I need some vitamin D, though. You know what you I mean? I need to take some to, supplements. I need some supplements. Mm. Or one of those, like, seasonal depression lights. Mm, mm. You know, the, the lamps. Or maybe make a closet out of that. <laughs> like a tanning thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think my answer changes, honestly, depending on my mood. Right now, I'd be a lone wanderer. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'm feeling, I don't know. I'm feeling some kind of way. Scared of her. <laughs> It's interesting because when Lucy and Maximus meet, Lucy seems like she's kind of on a path toward maybe losing some of humanity, of her humanity, but Maximus maybe is heading towards embracing his more, leaving behind the sort of strict confines he was in. Do we see that duality kind of explored between them? Yes. And I think that what's really amazing about what Graham and Geneva and Jonah have come up with with this story is that we get a real treat as an audience of not really being able to know what's going to come next. Um, and, and yeah, the, it's, um, it's, it's because the wasteland is filled with so much, you know what I mean? It's such a harsh uh, condition to live within. So it, there's just so much that can change in an instant. Mm. You said they both have something that the other person needs at any given moment and I think there is a beautiful duality between them when you see them me and, and and form a relationship it's it's kind of wild how two completely different people um kind of can become so you know can, can uh, have so much in common hi Kyle your character Hank appears to be a wholesome all-american father and caretaker but yes. there's surely more to him than meets the eye can you tease anything about the character's hidden layers um well you're very perceptive Ro. um there are definitely le levels to Hank which uh we will we will discover as the series progresses 
Um, there are some um, glimmers of what another part of who he is in some of the sequences, uh, some of the fight sequences that, that we see in the course of the show. Um, he seems to have a particular fondness for a fairly brutal tactics um, and almost enjoying them too much, uh, which raises the question of kind of where he comes from and who he is. And the most impactful thing is of course that Lucy, who's his daughter, sees this, this behavior and it doesn't really jibe with the man that she knows is her father. It's confirmed that Vault 33 has rhubarb pie in its stores. But do you think Hank is also a lover of cherry pie and coffee? Oh, how could he not be? Honestly, he is all American. I would imagine that he has access to cherry pie and coffee. Oh, the question raises, like, where, where does the coffee come from? Is this coffee that's been sequestered? How old is the coffee? Has it aged well? Do they have coffee plants? We don't know. If I, if I may, I'm just going to enjoy a little sip of my vault Tech coffee right now. Mm. Please do. It's very good. There's a certain radiation quality to it, which makes it extra special. It adds a little something. Yes. Uh, if you were transported into the world of Fallout, would you be a vault dweller, a lone wanderer, or part of the Brotherhood of Steel? Ooh, it's a good question. I. I, I like to think that I'd be part of the Brotherhood of Steel, but I don't think I could really endure the all of the uh, all the training and all of that. So I probably would I probably would end up being a vault dweller, doing my best to serve the community. I don't think I'd survive as a lone wolf. I think I would get too lonely. We all we all need a little community. I uh, agree. But speaking of Hank's relationship, he seems to have a great kind of interaction with Lucy, but he also raised a kind of miserly and angry son in Norm. <laughs> what do you think Hank's relationship is like with his son? And what do you think yeah. that reveals about Hank? It's it's an interesting question because we don't spend a whole, I don't spend a whole lot of time with Norm except correcting him um, and, and, and uh, with a slight bit of torment and glee. Um, you know, it's, um, it's a thing where probably uh, I, I would imagine uh, Hank is not he's not embarrassed by his son, but he's certainly he's certainly not the apple of his eye. I mean, I think he loves his children, of course, but he has a particular fondness for his daughter, who is an overachiever. Everything that Hank is is his daughter. She represents all the best qualities of Hank. So of course he's in love with her and adores her as his child. Norm, uh, you know, he, he hasn't had a chance yet to exhibit the qualities that are really going to make him stand out. Not that he doesn't have a chance to or an opportunity to, and I hope it happens, but we'll have to see. There seems to be a mystery going on about Lucy's mother and Hank's wife. Is Hank hiding something about her fate from his family and the vault community? Well, the, the easy answer would be, of course, no, of course not. Um, but in fact, uh, there are, uh, there is an uh, elements there about his wife that he has not been completely forthcoming about. Um, and again, as we journey and take this journey through the eight episodes, um, we'll begin to get a sense that there's more there perhaps than what Hank has been saying. Great. Well, I think that's all our time today, but thank you so much. And I hope you continue to enjoy your coffee this morning. Thank you, Ro.